Aloha and welcome to Ehana Kako. We're a weekly program on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. I'm Kili Akina, president of the Grassroot Institute. We're going to take the opportunity today to have a very special edition of Ehana Kako. From time to time, we do what I call policy talk. We talk with some of the policy analysts at the Grassroot Institute and look at issues that are taking place and deserving our attention in our state, in our country, and in our world. Today we're going to take a look at the state legislature. We're in the midst of the 2015 session and there is a sausage being made. You know that old adage, there are two things that you don't want to know how are done, the making of sausage and the making of laws. But we're not going to focus on the political players, as exciting as that is, nor on the politics of it all. We're going to take a look at the actual issues to see how thinking people may want to think about the proposals that are putting, being put forth uh, in front of the legislators. Let me talk for a moment about our state legislature. It's a unique body. It was actually started in the Kingdom of Hawaii in 1840 and has run continuously since then. At that time, uh, we had two houses patterned after the United States Congress, and there was the House of Representatives, which has run continuously to this day, and the upper house, known as the House of Nobles back then. Then, uh, in uh, the late 1800s, so with the transition of power from the Kingdom of Hawaii to the United States, this noble body was uh, reinstantiated, and in 1959, when Hawaii became a state, we defined in our state constitution that there shall be two houses, the House of Representatives, which consists of 51 members, and the State Senate, which consists of 25. Now, interesting as well is the shift in political power. At the time of coming into existence of the state legislature, we had a strong uh, Republican representation. Today, of the 51 members of the House of Representatives, 44 are Democrats and 7 are Republicans. And of the 25 members of the State Senate, 24 are Democrats and one is a Republican. In fact, he's often been called, Senator Sam Sloan, the loneliest senator in America. Well, this is our state legislature, the body that makes the laws for the state and the people of Hawaii. And today I'm very delighted to have with us two members of the Grassroot Institute uh, Think Tank, uh, a think tank which is independent and which looks carefully at issues of government, uh, economy, and society. Uh, the two members, one joining us from Washington, D.C., is our director of policy, a local girl who resides in the D.C. area, Malia Blom-Hill. Malia, welcome. I'm delighted to have you here. I know I usually talk with you at our weekly policy meetings by distance, but uh, aloha from Hawaii, from your homeland. Hello. Thank you for having me. Well, looking forward to your weighing in. Uh, and for those of you who are watching from anywhere in the world, Malia is a top expert on policy in the state of Hawaii, which she watches very carefully, especially from snowy Virginia and D.C. as she looks at, at pictures of the sunsets and sunrises here. Sorry you don't have those live. <laughs> Me too. To my uh, left here today is policy uh, researcher and our vice president for research and development, Joe Kent. Uh, Joe has extensive background as an activist and uh, even as a, a political actor. We'll leave that for another show sometime. But Joe, I'm so glad that you're with us today. Welcome to the program. Thank you so much. And it's really exciting to watch as um, bills start to move forward. That's right. Now we're past the halfway point. And you've been involved not only in crafting our policy positions at the Grassroot Institute, but you've gone down to the legislature. You've testified in front of hearings and so forth, right. as have I. Uh, how, how, how is that experience going down and actually presenting testimony, not from a special interest group, but from an independent think tank? Well, uh, I have to be honest, it's a little intimidating, actually. You're there with all these very important people uh, in front of you and behind you, and to get up and, and uh, read your little paper, um, it, it is a little intimidating, but um, it's surprising how much people actually value the information that you have to share, because a lot of the uh, policymakers, maybe they don't know the research that you've uh, that you've That's done. That's right. Out. So it's important mm -hmm. to do that. And, and where we come from in terms of our point of view, perhaps Malia, you could say a few words to this. Uh, every week at the Grassroot Institute, uh, we convene a policy 
discussion. And it consists of individuals representing the media, special areas of expertise, our own policy staff. And, and Malia from DC actually leads this meeting. Uh, would you address what it means for us to come from an independent point of view? I, I know that when many people discuss policy and then go down to the legislature, they're representing a union or they're representing a company or they're representing a political party, a certain point of view. Uh, we really don't have a constituency like that that we represent. We, we just kind of go down there and, and we present what we consider to be rational and true. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yes, I mean, our, our special interest, so to speak, is really just the mission of our organization. We are interested in, in liberty, individual liberty, limited accountable government. And that is the prism through which we view all of the legislation that comes before the legislature every session. And that is plenty. It gives us a lot of scope, uh, especially considering the uh, thrust of legislative uh, proposals that are before the Hawaii legislature pretty much every year. So, you know, our interest when we go before the legislature, you know, the unions will go up and they'll talk about the union interests and the, you know, industry will go up, they'll talk about their industry interest. Our interest is about promoting uh, limited government and accountable government and free market principles. That's right. So, as an independent think tank, we are not Republican, we are not Democrat, we I won't say we strive, but we certainly achieve making everyone unhappy. Which is how that, we know that doing it right. So. You know that that is right. You said we we managed to make everybody unhappy at one point or another. Well, we we hope we do make some people happy some of the time. Although I have seen that um, so after I give testimony, lots of people come up to me and say. Who are you? Uh, this was fantastic. That's right. And, uh, we actually have a dog in this fight, so it's uh, really rewarding when that happens. Absolutely. So. On a technical level, one of the ways that we maintain our independence is by not receiving money from the government, from the university, from the military, and as a result, we are able to have a point of view that is independent, that represents the people. The other thing, too, is this. Uh, when we develop our policy, uh, although we're a nonprofit organization and receive contributions from the public, we really don't know what our public b believes. Uh, we Obviously, they believe that our work is good, but once in a while, we will actually put forth a position that angers members of the Grassroot Institute. And I kind of like that, because it, it, uh, to, to their, their credit, they're supporting us, even though they know that we may or may not necessarily line up with what they believe. And we have the freedom with which simply to stand for what is logical, rational, and good for the country and for the state, rather than worrying about representing a group. And so that's what's meant by being independent. Now, Joe, would you do something for us? So, since you do keep track of our, our local legislation, would you walk us through some of sure. the, the issues that are live at the legislature or have been there in this 2015 term? And we could do a little bit of talking about what our rationale is. In fact, I, I believe you have the stack of documents yeah. Which constitutes our positions and testimony, which have been on a great number of bills spanning a broad spectrum. Oh, absolutely, we've been hard at work, and there's a whole buffet of uh, bills that are up at the legislature, and some are dying, some are passing, and we are past the halfway point. We've got bills on um, rail, on taxation, on small business regulation, on. Um, uh, on cars, on dancing even, um, so we're in for a wild ride. Um, let's start with the, the rail. Um, the rail surcharge, HB 134, um, is, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Malia, a permanent county surcharge? Yes, uh, this is, they've tried to take several bites at the apple. HB 134 is the most recent effort and the one we testified on most recently. And it, this one, this particular one, looks for a permanent county surcharge by all counties of, if I'm not mistaken, 0.25% um, in all state and excise tax. Well, 0.25%, uh, um, just me as a layperson, it doesn't sound like that much. Oh, only 0.25%? What, what is the issue with this bill? Well, I mean, there's a couple different things here. I mean, there's the immediate political. There's the fact that we were promised the surcharge for rail would be temporary. There's questions about how the project is being carried out. 
um, what promises were made, what is not being fulfilled, will it be able to fund itself, are we getting into an endless thing? And that's the, that's the immediate political questions about rail, but there's also a sort of larger economic question that comes with continuing to add little bits and pieces to the general excise tax. And that's a, a general principle that we, uh, to, that we like to point out. Um, raising taxes, especially consumption taxes like the excise tax, is something that you do to discourage consumption, essentially. It's, it's almost always accompanied by lower revenues. And so this idea that we're going to hitch our wagon, we're going to solve our economic woes by continuing to the, a little bit of a raise of the excise tax here and a little bit there and a little bit here. And then, you know, very rarely are legislatures able to or so foolhardy as to throw a big, giant, you know, 25% raise of a tax in one go. But it's, um, it's like being nibbled to death by ducks. And you know, the, Malia here. mentioned that there's a political side to it as well. Uh, you are correct, Malia. The mechanism by which the legislature seeks to raise more money to pay for the rail project is not a good mechanism. It's taxing the people. First of all, as you pointed out, we were promised that the increase on our GE tax would expire, but now it's going to continue at a certain rate. But more than that, there, there's the overall question. Should the state legislature be strapped with having to fund a rail project that continues to skyrocket in price? Um, I participated in and attended, oh, perhaps a total of 12 to 15 hours of hearings in various committees on, on, on this bill in, in its various forms in the House and, and, and the Senate. And, and one of the things that, that became very clear is that there is no absolute picture as to what the price of the rail will be in the long run. What was that like to sit in there for 15 hours, you said? Uh, in various uh, hearings and so yeah, forth. Yeah, what was that like? Well, uh, the vast majority of, of testimony demonstrated that, that we're dealing with something that is hard to define. What is the cost of the rail going to be? Mm -hmm. When will it be completed? How do you account for the fact that so far in the first two miles it has had such a, a high increase in the costs? And how can you guarantee that when the, uh, we are five years or ten years into the project, we won't be facing higher prices. But unfortunately, there seems to be this sense that the legislature has the responsibility to bail this project out. Mm. And the, 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 the disappointing thing is this. There seems to be only one avenue by which funding is, is, is considered, and that is the solution then is tax the people more, mm -hmm. tax them on the GE tax. And there's some real problems with the GE tax. I know uh, Mil uh, Malia and I have, have often discussed the problem of the GE tax on the poor, on the middle class, uh, on those least able to pay it. Yeah, the GE tax is a regressive tax, and that means it does hit the poorest people the worst. Uh, the latest study um, basically said that the lowest, the poorest 20% of the Hawaii population pay approximately 11% of their income in G GE tax costs. That's 11% of everything that they make is just spent on the GE tax. And that goes down the richer you get, but essentially we are funding these projects on the back of the people least able to afford it. And, and regressive tax... What does that mean to the average person if oh, something is I'm, regressive? I'm sorry. A regressive tax is the opposite of a progressive tax. A progressive tax is one where we tax the wealthier at a higher rate. Mm -hmm. It has a higher, it has a larger impact on the wealthy. A regressive tax is where it actually has a heavier impact on the poorer. So citizens. even though this um, surcharge is seems small, 0.25 percent it's actually huge when it comes to the people who it's actually affecting. Well, it has more of an impact relatively on, on those who are least able to pay. Uh, we're going to continue in our discussion of uh, legislative items down at the state legislature in 2015, right after a short break. This is Kaylee Akina with Malia Hill and Joe Kent from the Grassroot Institute on a Hanakako. Don't go away. We'll be right back after this. Hi, I'm your host on Think Tech Asia, Bill Sharp. I Good. look forward um, to think you I joining us each Monday between 4 and 5 o'clock uh, mm -hmm. when we film right here in our studio <laughs> in downtown Honolulu. I think the show, Think Tech Asia, focuses on contemporary events in Asia. And by Asia, we mean anything from Hawaii, south to Australia and New Zealand, uh, west to Pakistan, and as far north as the Russian Far East. 
clearly this is one of the most economically dynamic centers of the world. Uh, and we bring you up to date on what's going on in a whole host of countries in this very vital region. We look forward to seeing you. Aloha. Hi, aloha. My name is Chris Leatham, and I have host a show called The Economy and You. Uh, the show plays every Wednesday at noon. And on my show, I bring on guests who are interested or working in the technology space. And uh, so I'd like you to come and watch the show and learn with me about all the sort of exciting things that we're doing in Hawaii to build and grow our economy ecosystem. So I'd like to say aloha, and I look forward to seeing you on the show. Thank you. Hi, my name is Seymour Kazimersky. I have a show called Seymour's World on Think Tech Hawaii. Our show is about opening minds and facilitating conversation. To tell you the truth, I have no idea what we're going to be talking about. I have no idea who our guests are going to be. But I guarantee you we're going to have lots and lots of fun. Aloha from Seymour's World. broadcast network. I'd like to say thanks to Jay Fidel and the great team of staff and volunteers and board of directors that make Think Tech Hawaii work. We produce about 35 hours of original content from downtown Honolulu going all over the world. You can get that content on www.thinktechhawaii.com. Now back to our exciting conversation with some of the policy team at the Grassroot Institute. Joe, we were talking about which uh, piece of legislation. We were talking about um, the rail surcharge, which um, which adds a permanent county surcharge. Um, and we were just finishing saying that a GE tax hike or surcharge um, affects the poor the most. That's right. Uh, y the problem is not so much whether we should go forward with the rail or not go forward with the rail. What our legislature is dealing with in this piece of legislation is how to fund it. it, it it's quite clear politically that the, the will and the decision of the legislators is to go forth. It's quite clear politically that they have taken responsibility for a city and county project. So now what they're talking about is how do we fund it? And, and the, the thing that disturbs me the most is that the most creative solution is to tax the people mm -hmm. and to tax them more and to tax them with a tax that hurts the poor more than any others. Uh, there, there are numerous proposals for how it can be funded and numerous proposals for how the cost can be brought down or how the project, even at this late stage, which is fairly early, can be modified. But those are not really being entertained. Mm -hmm. uh, Malia spoke earlier about the problem of the regressive nature of this tax. There's also a problem in terms of our economy. Uh, the, the whole theory being looked at is that if the government w needs money, let's take it away from the consumer and let's take it away from the businesses so that we can fund government so they can do good things for consumers and businesses. But, but that's backward. Uh, you've studied economics. You know that, that it really works this way. When you let consumers spend their money, keep it, they will spend it. When they spend their money, businesses benefit. Businesses do more business activity. When businesses do more business activity and there's more market activity, there is more money for the government to collect through income taxes at the end. And one of the things that we have insisted on at the uh, hearings when we've gone as Grassroot Institute is that if you examine the 50 states as we do as part of a 50 state network of think tanks, there are best practices. Mm -hmm. And organizations like the Alec Laufer uh, report uh, that publishes a list of best practices ranks Hawaii near the bottom in, in terms of its business tax environment because of the extent to which we rely on the GE tax mm -hmm. in, in order to fund whatever we need. And I the, think when it comes to, yes. be, when it comes to best practices, um, I, the, the response I often hear to, oh, well, um, best practices across the nation is that, well, Hawaii is different. And maybe those best practices don't work in Hawaii. But it's still important to look at the best practices and see, That's will, right. will it help us? Well, the, the fallacy of this thinking is to think that there's Hawaii and then there are 49 states. Uh, but that's not what best practice research does. Best practice research looks at all 50 states and national, na nations and cities across the world. There are numerous indexes that cover everything from Seoul, Korea, to Singapore, to, to uh, Des Moines. <laughs> <laughs> right. And we can see how certain practices in a variety of municipalities, counties, 
and the state and federal governments, how these practices actually impact the economy. And based on that research, we're able to say, for example, it, it goes without saying, when you take the GE tax off of medicine and off of food, you actually help the income of the poor and you actually create greater revenues for the government in the end. We, we can actually say that that's a practice that works regardless of where it takes place. And speaking of best practices, um, I've done a lot of best practice research when it comes to the hospital on Maui. Um, right now, there's a bill, HB 1075, which authorizes the Maui Regional Hospital System to enter into an agreement with a private entity to transition one or more of its facilities into a new private Hawaii nonprofit corporation. And in uh, English, that means a public-private partnership with a, uh, with a private corporation. That's now, right. When you first hear that, oh, we've got a, ho a public hospital which is now going to be uh, partnered with a private entity, um, many people might seem worried. And just because um, something is uh, intuitive, it might be counterintuitive. And it might be that, as we've seen with all the research across the nation, that this could actually save the hospital. That's right. One of the problems is this. When the kind of feedback you get in the private sector doesn't affect you in government. In, in the private sector, in business, if your business fails, fails to run, run itself well and goes bankrupt, you're out. In government, you can keep taxing the taxpayers and keep a, a dying business going. Mm -hmm. And the bottom line is this. We have failed as a state in being able to operate the business of our state hospital corporation. Uh, the costs have risen tremendously, largely because of labor costs. But the ability to raise the prices is limited. So when you're, you're trapped in that area where you can't raise, you can't lower your costs and you can't raise your prices, mm -hmm you go out of business. And so uh, our healthcare corporation is on the brink of bankruptcy and right. is being sustained only by taxing the taxpayers. And that's the fundamental problem. And uh, a big um, consequence of that problem is why don't we have enough doctors in our state? This is a question that so many people bring up. Where have, where have all the doctors gone? And especially on Maui, and I used to live on Maui, and yes. I, I was sick one time, and I. Um, had trouble finding a doctor. I had to drive for an hour just to get to, to a hospital. And it was, um, it, it was a pain. And just imagine um, a, a failing um, hospital system with prices that aren't allowed to go That's up or right. down. And the doctors are fleeing Maui. And um, with this change, it may be that it could save the hospital as it's done in many other um, cities and, and states across the nation. So it's really interesting to see this. This looks like the first time that, to my knowledge, that this kind of thing has been done in, in the state. Well, outside of Hawaii, Malia, perhaps you can address this a bit. Have we seen successful public-private par partnerships where government has handed over to private corporations the management of essential functions uh, and non-essential functions, hospitals and so forth? Yes, this is actually um, something that has been tried and succeeded in other states. Um, you know, I think Joe has also done some research on this. I believe California is one. Mm -hmm. And I mean, this this basically underlines the fallacy of that whole argument against Hawaii is, Hawaii is different, Hawaii is special. When you, when you dismiss best practices argumentation, because what you're really saying is, you know, gravity is the same everywhere on Earth except Hawaii. You know, we sh <laughs> the basic rules of economics apply everywhere else on Earth except Hawaii. You know, it's a sort of nonsensical position being used to excuse um, basically a doctrinaire position. You know, it's, it says more about the person making the argument <laughs> than anything else. Right, and um, Malia, I, going along with that, things that work elsewhere and um, are different here, to my knowledge, it is illegal to, if you want to bake cookies in your, um, if, in your kitchen, for example, and then to go and sell them. Is that correct? Oh, you're talking about the cottage food, uh, 
issue. Right, um, right. And I can read the I can read the uh, the bill here before we introduce it. I'm talking about SB 379, which is uh, requires cottage food operators who produce non potentially hazardous food products in a home kitchen or farm kitchen for direct sale to consumers to obtain a cottage food operation permit from the Department of Health. So what does that mean? Uh, in non legislative ease, that means <laughs> yeah. Um, it's essentially allowing people to sell cookies that they made or jams, sort of like non-perishable, reasonably safe food items that you make in a farm kitchen or a home kitchen, you know, like for a farmer's market. Um, and currently, that's a big question. There's a big question mark over that. It's technically speaking illegal, which doesn't mean that necessarily the state is running around, you know, trying to clap people in jail for selling jam. But it does put the, anyone who does this in a sort of weird legal limbo. And this is actually, for all of its confusing language, <laughs> a step in the right direction into giving people who want to, who have these very small sort of cottage industries, cottage food uh, production things, uh, some, some knowledge, some, some, a safe harbor to, to, sell their, to sell their goods in a very small way. And this is a kind of, you know, this is, <laughs> We have a state that loves regulation, and this is one of those situations where we're in the weird position of favoring regulation because it makes it clear for the people who are affected by it. Uh, most of the time, you know, the grassroots is not out there going, yay, more regulation. But this is one of those strange situations where people who previously were doing this were, didn't know, didn't know whether they were safe, didn't know whether the Department sure. of Health was all of a sudden going to clamp down on what they were doing. And this, this idea, this license that will let people continue to do that legally makes it clear for them. And also going along with that, um, SB 868, which requires county liquor commissions to prescribe regulation on dancing in establishments. You, you said that it's a good idea to make things clear. And Yeah, it's, uh, a, it's a basic legal principle to say that before you make something illegal, before you outlaw something, before you chase after people with the full weight of government, they need to know what it is that is safe, what is illegal, what can get them in trouble. You know, Otherwise, it's not fair as a law. I mean, it's really a question of fairness when it comes right down to it. And so the dancing thing, I've, maybe some of our viewers already know about the whole issue with whether or not you can shut down, whether you can have rules about dancing, whether you can shut Wait down something. Wait a second, is it, is it, illegal, is it illegal to dance in Hawaii? <laughs> Well, that's the big question mark, isn't it? And this is weirdly, as the phrasing of the you know law makes it, this is actually the legislature's attempt to make county liquor uh, laws, Bill County, the county, the counties, set forth clearly to establishments that serve liquor what they can do to be safe. Previously, it was too vague, and any you know local any county that decided to sort of exceed its authority and say oh you can't do that here they were able to under the previous law this is their attempt to say okay now if you're going to shut down somebody for dancing you have to make it a hundred percent clear why and how and how someone can be safe from being, being shut down for dancing which in hawaii it boggles the mind but <laughs> there you are i think at heart here is the question of what we're trying to accomplish and preserve as, as a people, as a legislature. Uh, if it is individual liberty, uh, the, then th this is something that has to guide the way in which we come up with regulations. We don't want to come up with regulations that oppress businesses and individuals and prevent them from doing what they would do, whether it is baking cookies and my selling one to you, uh, whether it is uh, you're offering me a ride to the other side of the island for 25 bucks, or, or whether it's uh, my letting your brother-in-law stay in my home uh, if he pays me when he comes here on his vacation. All of these practices I've described are uh, under consideration for further regulation. And, and one of the things that we want to point out is that regulation is not good or bad in and of itself. It's the, what regulation accomplishes. Does it produce greater freedoms for the individuals? Does it protect the, the uh, citizens against abuse and so forth? And we feel that regulations that do good for the people uh, actually 
and this may be counterintuitive to those who, who prefer total freedom, actually may be good. For example, in some of these cases, such as the transient accommodation tax, or uh, such as the, the, the cottage industry tax, or not tax, but regulation, mm -hmm. excuse me, actually put individuals onto the map by being regulated. Okay. It says, I've got a card here that says I can do this, so you can't just arbitrarily come down and, and shut me down. But we have to be balanced as to what the costs of those regulations are can on them. we talk about the uh, transient accommodations um, bill? Um, HB 875, it establishes licensing requirements and enforcement provisions for transient vacation rentals to be administered by the Department of Commerce and Consumer Affairs. Now, um, I'm lost already. What is transient accommodations? Well, this is really just about visitors. It's about tourist dollars. And um, fortunately, HB 25, this licensing attempt, this is the state's attempt to, they would say, bring in the rest of the, the sort of gray area, bed and breakfast type, you know, not hotels so much as these more informal kind of rentals for tourists that, you know, they should fall under the special tax that we have on them. Sure. Now, so this particular one... Sorry to cut you off, Malia, but uh, we'll come back right after this very short break and pick up w w with your comments on this bill. This is Kaylee Aquino with some of the team at the Grassroot Institute weighing in on the legislative proposals that are before our state legislature in 2015. Don't go away from Ehana Kako. We'll be right back after this. Inspired by an ancient culture, classical Chinese dance, vigorous physicality, timeless stories, 5,000 years of Chinese music and dance, Shen Yun presents authentic Chinese culture. Coming to Blaisdell Concert Hall, May 8th and 9th. Tickets at ShenYun.com or call 808-792-3919. Hi, I'm Jay Fidel. That's Ted Ralston. You know, Ted is the uh, host of uh, Where the Road Leads. It shows uh, every Friday from 4 to 5 p.m. It's about technology. It's about how people are collaborating and solve problems with modern technology. It's where the road leads. We all know that. We should all be listening. Join us there. 4 to 5 p.m. every Friday. Now, what about that do you agree with? All of it. I knew he'd say that. Aloha. Say aloha. Aloha. Good. Welcome back to Ehana Kako on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. Ehana Kako. It sounds like a venerable Hawaiian saying, which is e pule kako, and that means let's all pray together. Well, at the Grassroot Institute, we say Ehana Kako, let's all work together. Uh, let's work together to build a better economy, a better government, a better society. And often it is on the basis of our policy reflection that we can find positions that many different parties can come together on. And that pretty much drives the way we uh, look at policy. First we do the analysis, uh, what does this say, uh, what does it result in, and then we say, is there some aspect here where different people, whether they're Democrats or Republicans or Libertarians, wh wh whether they are local or mainland, whether they're visitors or whether they're residents, a way we can work together. Going back now to Joe and Malia, we're currently talking about uh, a bill and Malia was weighing in on that. Well, I, I want to say something first is um, I've got a question for Malia. So I've got an app on my phone and it's called Airbnb and I can um, tap it and it will open up a list of lots of different people who are um, renting out space in their homes, maybe for a night or two nights, something like that. And, and I, I might be able to get a place for uh, $50, something like that. Is this what this, tra is that uh, transient well, that, accommodations? That is, or that is what the government is trying to kind of grab a hold of. Because according to uh, their interpretation of it, yes. The person who gave you room via Airbnb should be paying a special tax, or, or more accurately, they should be charging you <laughs> than using that to pay their special tax, uh, the transient accommodations tax. And the idea is, is that you know a lot of these smaller things, like your Airbnb example, are not registered, they're not paying the tax, and the state would like to kind of bring them in and and have them and have them pay this tax. Obviously, they want new tax revenues. 
you know, there's a, there's a bunch of questions about that. And one of the some of the bills that have tried to deal with the transit accommodations tax, like HB 825, which you mentioned, kind of put forth a regulatory scheme, a licensing scheme. Um, the problem with that is that if you are, Mr. I occasionally rent a my room out on Airbnb, you don't really have a lot of motivation to identify yourself so that you can be taxed. It's not, it's not the kind of thing that lots of people um, who aren't already doing it ha are just dying to run in and go do. And so the, it's been a very difficult thing the legislature's been trying to do to find this balance, you know, where it won't cost the state more to chase down the guy who occasionally does an Airbnb thing, then it will, you know, then they'll get back in revenues. So and the, that's, you know, the person sorry. that, um, the person who does follow the regulations and does try as hard as they can to comply is the person who is uh, punished? Yeah, essentially the people bearing the burden of any licensing requirements are the people who are already complying with the law. You know, the people who haven't complied so far have no motivation by throwing more licensing requirements to go do it, and the state does not have the capability at this time to enforce it. Now, they've moved from that, that, that bill was deferred, uh, to attempts to just um, maybe improve enforcement of existing law and to up the transit accommodation tax rate on certain properties like timeshares. Mm -hmm. Dr. This Kina. goes back to Go Kaylee's point earlier about revenue streams. And, you know, tourist dollars are very important to Hawaii, and the state, can t instead of looking at other ways to raise revenue, is constantly poking that golden goose in the hopes of draining a little more money out of it for the tax coffers. Sure. Malia, that's not all that different from uh, other bills that we've been discussing, and, and some we haven't discussed yet. House Bill 330 wants to add 1% to the GET, which would be one-fourth higher, really. It, it's a huge amount uh, for the state to be able to purchase agricultural pro uh, properties. SB 727 and HB 1253 uh, want to add 0.5% surcharge uh, on the GET for long-term care and so forth. And, and we can go on and on. There, there are at least half a dozen bills that are still alive that are trying to raise the general excise tax and, and the, we can lump them all together and simply say this there have to be more creative ways that our governor and our state legislature bring to the table for raising the revenues we can think of two of them right now number one very quickly let's recognize we've got to bring costs of state government down so rather than going out and taxing citizens more let's stop paying for wasteful programs that are ineffective and duplicative and number two let's put a lot more focus on building a booming economy that's an investment destination for money from asia from the rest of the world that's a subject for a whole another program but let me get back to you as you guide but, us yeah, to the that, last couple that reminds minutes. me of a, a a comic i saw where it, it was there's two panels on one side you had a business that says oh no we're we're not making profits and then the the business said well it looks like we're going to have to work harder and then on the other side you had a government you said oh no it looks like uh, our revenues are going down and then they say well it looks like the taxpayers are going to have to work harder it's and, right it falls <laughs> on the taxpayer right and, and uh, if anything that's the interest we try to represent. That is all citizens together who have to bear the, the burden of an expensive government. You know, I, um, I'm just fascinated with um, the new technologies that we're seeing, um, it, well, mentioned in many of the bills right now, but, uh, but also in our lives. I mean, right now you can use your iPhone to go shopping, you can um, get an apartment, you can even get a car on a on your iPhone now and uh, the legislature is scratching their heads right now because maybe they don't understand the technologies maybe they do and maybe they want this um, business to survive sure. or what but everyone has their their hands in this that's right. right now so it's really interesting that's right and, and some legislation addresses the fact that a new factor has entered our transportation economy the rideshare program represented by com companies like uber uh, we think it's important for us to understand that this must not be about favoring rideshare over taxis or favoring taxis over rideshare, but rather the government 
has the interest of the people at, at, my, at heart, which is the consumer. And we've got to let a free market work in such a way that it benefits all players properly. Uh, that, that's an important thing. So one of the things that we would call for as they, they examine this is, is not so much the question of regulating one or the other, but rather, how about bringing regulations down on the taxi industry in and of itself as a starting point for this discussion? Right. If you, I went through and looked at all the taxi regulations in the county of Honolulu, and there are a lot of hoops that they have to jump through. That's right. Um, they have to get uh, meters, and they have to um, get licenses and all this. And um, th th this is a lot of regulation that taxi um, companies That's right. suffer with. And um, Uber right now it operates unregulated That's in right. Hawaii. Um, it has for more than a year. Mm -hmm. um, and in other states and uh, across the nation, they have passed reasonable regulations That's right. that, um, that help both. So Uber can survive, taxi companies can survive, and any, anything in the middle, a taxi slash uh, uh, internet company can also survive. That's right. In fact, one of the taxi companies, one of the major taxi companies here in Hawaii, Echo Cab, has recently authorized its own drivers to be Uber drivers as well and switch between their Echo Cab platform and their Uber platform because of the technology. I think the bottom line is, is this. Government can't play favorites. And so we recognize that the taxi cab traditionally, the traditional companies, will be hit hard by a, a new industry a competitor who comes in without regulation. But the solution is not to make it so much harder for anyone to come into the market. The solution would be, well, let's make it easier for taxi cabs to s survive, and maybe we don't need that level of regulation that is oppressive to them. Right. Um, regulations um, are needed for safety, and uh, basically that's it. I mean, if it's, if it's safe and if it's voluntary, Absolutely. then great. A final word, Malia, before we close, uh, just on your perspective on policy. Thank you. You know, I think that we, we stand athwart the legislature yelling stop a lot of the time, um, or at least think about this a little more carefully before you go through it. But there is, there is, there are bright spots. There have been things that we've been able to champion, you know, where, where we're talking about reasonable regulation, where we're talking about opportunities to improve the economy. And so I think I would tell people, you know, it sometimes sounds like we're complaining, <laughs> Um, but that there's a lot to be optimistic about as well in this session. Joe, I'm so glad you were he here with us today to walk us through the legislation. Any last word you'd say to our viewers? Well, um, keep looking for open government and uh, open transparency and um, keep championing the work that we're doing. Very good. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's run through some of the legislation we're watching on your behalf at the Grassroot Institute. Uh, we want to serve the public interest and uh, perhaps you want to take part in, in the, the nerd type of talk that we have as policy wonks. Uh, we welcome you to visit us at grassrootinstitute.org. Until next time on Ehana Kako and the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network, aloha. Very good. Good. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>